Yeah, thank you so much for the introduction. So mm -hmm. yeah, I'm really excited to virtually meet like all of you and share my research about learning-based program synthesis. So first, what do I mean by program synthesis? Basically, instead of writing all the code ourselves, we want the machine to automatically generate programs according to our descriptions. And the long-term goal of program synthesis research is to democratize programming so that general computer users without coding skills can also benefit from all the progress of programming technologies to automate their tasks. Recently, we have really seen huge breakthroughs on large language models for code, especially for code generation from natural language. So here on the slides, I'm showing a demo from OpenAI Codex. So Codex is a language model that has 175 billion parameters. It was initialized from the GPT-3 checkpoint, which was pre-trained on text. Then Codex is further trained on GitHub code corpus. As we can see, with this large-scale pre-training and large-scale model, Codex can achieve pretty impressive performance on following natural language instructions like step by step. So like here, this uh, uh, instruction is actually pretty like complicated and detailed, but still the model is able to follow it very faithfully. Another recent effort to further show the power of language models for code is the DeepMind Alpha Code project. I also work on this project when I interned at DeepMind. So in this project, we focus on competitive programming problems. Well, like, Besides understanding the very complicated input natural language, the model need also needs to have some level of algorithmic reasoning capability so it can come up with an algorithm that can efficiently solve the problem and also to implement the code accurately. And later on uh, in the talk, I will also discuss some techniques proposed in this alpha code project. So natural language is just one format to describe the intended program functionality. Another program classification format is input output examples. So here, basically, the generated program should transform a list inputs to the outputs after execution. And in real applications, the programming context might not be always sequential. Sometimes we might also want have some semi-structured context with multiple data formats. So for example, uh, for my like a project spreadsheet coder, I show that we can design a model to generate these special formulas in, in Google Sheets, which includes this tabular context. And this model was integrated like, into the Google Sheets product, and it right now has hundreds of millions of users. In learning for program synthesis research, or program synthesis in general, I believe there are two core, core like, challenges to consider, which are the input ambiguity and the program capacity. The input ambiguity means whether the program description is precise enough to specify the program execution behavior. And the program capacity means the length of the program and the control flow structures that can be practically synthesized. So in this talk, I will discuss several applications highlighting different aspects of these challenges. In my work on programming with text, the main challenge is to handle the input ambiguity, as user-written natural language descriptions usually lack enough details. Then for program by sample problems, the program classification includes input-output examples. So it is easier to utilize execution results to scale out the program search. Then for competitive programming problems, the program description includes both natural language and input-output pairs. So we can like uh, further utilize this more information to reduce the ambiguity of program description and to synthesize some more complicated code. So learning for program synthesis applications is just like a one, like one aspect of learning based program synthesis research. Another line of research in this space is program synthesis for learning. We will consider the program as a means of representing some like a reasoning process for broader learning problems. So why is it beneficial to learn these program representations beyond programming and software engineering applications? 
the main goal here is to improve the existing neural networks on their capabilities of performing some symbolic like reasoning and generalization tasks. So here I will highlight one uh, challenge called conversational generalization. And I will use an example of pseudo language understanding task to illustrate this challenge. So on the slides, I'm showing uh, some study instructions or our training set, which demonstrates the primitive mapping between pseudo words and colored circles. Like here, the pseudo word text is mapped to a red circle. Besides these primitive definitions, the training set also includes some dis descriptions of functions. So for example, here, I show a pseudo word fab and includes like two related instructions, lagfab and dexfab. So lagfab is translated to three blue circles. And because we have seen that lag is mapped to a blue circle, so one hypothesis is that fab means thrice. We can confirm this hypothesis with another exam instruction, dexfab. Then the test time will be given some new test instructions, such as dubfab here. So these are some new combinations of these like learned primitives and functions in the training set. Then for us as humans, given only a few samples, we can already infer that dubfab means three yellow circles. So here I'm showing the full picture of this like a uh, compositional generalization experiment. So we can see that in total, there are only slightly over 10 study instructions for training. And some test instructions are longer than any of these training instructions. So for us as humans, we are very capable of understanding this like a uh, composition of grammars and with only a few demonstrations. But standard to standard sequence, sequence models are really struggling at achieving this level of generalization. So my, my research in the space of program synthesis learning and to address these challenges, and it emphasizes a third challenge of generalization. So in this talk, I will discuss uh, my works in this space, which includes grammar learning with a few demonstrations from scratch. And also I will discuss how we can leverage the pre trained large language models to improve conversational generalization for understanding real world programming languages, such as those SQL like languages. So, in this talk, I will highlight three lines of my works focusing on these three dimensions of challenges. First, I will discuss my work, Spreadsheet Coder, where I demonstrate how we can design these learning based program synthesis models to like, uh, handle those like, uh, ambiguity in user written descriptions and how this model can be utilized in production. In the second part, I will discuss my work on learning with execution for program synthesis. I will first discuss my work execution guided program synthesis, where I demonstrate that with input-output examples in the program classification, our model can utilize these intermediate execution results to improve the complexity of programs that can be synthesized. Then in the alpha code project, we further show that by leveraging this execution at scale, we can enable the model to solve more challenging competitive programming problems. In the third part, I will discuss my work on compositional generalization via program learning. So I will first talk about my work neural symbolic stack machines, where I show that incorporating these symbolic modules into deep neural networks is critical for achieving this level of generalization when training from only a few like uh, samples and also train a model from scratch. Then I would also like to briefly discuss our recent project, which is uh, called Dynamic List to Most Prompting, where we show that uh, with a proper design of the prompting scheme, we can also unlock this like a uh, conversational generalization capability of existing powerful pre-trained large language models for understanding like uh, programming languages such as Sparkle here. So uh, let's get started with the first part about spreadsheet coder. But also I want to check uh, whether there are some uh, questions. Uh, okay, uh, if there's uh, if there's no question, I can uh, I can continue. Or if there is any question in the class, I can also stop and take some questions. No, I don't see any questions. Any questions from from the yeah? Because I saw some chat messages, but I realized that it is uh, not a question for the current presentation. 
They're praising your uh, presentation. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, then I think I can get started to the technical part. Yeah, uh, so basically for the first part is, uh, I want to first introduce the programming context and the problem setup of this spreadsheet code project about some like production usage of these learning-based program synthesis models. So basically, like uh, given all these like a uh, tabular context, including these cell values and also table headers, then uh, once the user types in some assignment operator in this like a uh, Google Sheets like a uh, like um like a uh, like a product, then uh we can know that this user might want to write some special formulas. So in this case, as uh, the special coder model will be activated to provide some formula suggestions. As you can see. Here, the user didn't provide any like, detailed or precise descriptions about the formulas they want. So the model needs to infer everything from the context. But still, uh, the model can, did, can do a pretty good job um, for this task, even for generating some like, um, pretty like, um, like, um, like complicated formulas with some nasty operations. So the special language supports a wide range of formulas. The previous demo showed like one like a common common use case, which is numerical calculation. Besides that, special coder can also support the prediction of these conditional statements and the formulas for table lookups, etc. In total, there are around 100 commonly used operators in supported by special coder. And this is a pretty comprehensive set for real world use case. So predicting a variety of formulas in user-written spreadsheets in a while introduces some new challenges. The first challenge is to understand like this spreadsheet data uh, in different formats. Specifically, the model needs to understand these like table headers, which are usually some very short natural language descriptions of the spreadsheet data. And also the model needs to understand these like, cell values, which can be numbers and string literals. Then the second challenge is to understand the spreadsheet structure. So spreadsheet formulas do not always operate on a single row or a single column. Instead, these stack formulas can operate on multiple rows and columns simultaneously. Therefore, it is very important to represent this tabular structure of the spreadsheet data. However, if you want to encode this stack a uh, two-dimensional tabular context, then like uh, one challenge is that the, the real world users written spreadsheet tables can be pretty large. Like on the slides, I'm showing an example where there are over 11,000 rows in a single table. So in this case, if you want to encode this table of contents, then we really need to like uh, consider how to represent this long range de dependency of different cells. So facing all these challenges, there are several goals you want to achieve with our model architecture design. First, the model needs to embed different input data formats, including natural language, numerical values, string literals, et cetera. The model also needs to represent the input tablet structure while modeling the long range dependency of the input data. And finally, the model needs to be able to decode various formulas. So with these goals in mind, our problem setup is that the model input include like uh, both of these like uh, headers and surrounding cell values. And the model output is this spreadsheet formula. Here I'm presenting the overview of our spreadsheet code architecture with the focus of modeling both the input and output structures. At high level, our spreadsheet code architecture has two key components. One is the encoder, where we consider the input data as a semi-structure table. Another component is the decoder, and we design a two-stage decoding process to, to like, uh, generate these formulas. And in total, there are around 100 million parameters for this spreadsheet code architecture. This is like, uh, relatively small compared to recent language models for code. And it is also very desirable for the pro production usage because it can, with uh, this like, um, model that is not super large, it can also speed up the inference like um, time like process of this data. So now I will discuss some like key techniques proposed in this architecture. 
And first, it is about the encoder part. So to compute the embedding vectors for all the cell values, we first utilize this BERT encoder, which is, was initially designed for handling those sequential input data. Then to embed these two-dimensional tables, we first serialize the table by concatenating these cells in different rows and columns. So in this way, we can still compute the embedding vectors for each of these cells. But as we discussed before, the full spreadsheet tables can be uh, pretty large. So it is computationally expensive or intractable to embed all the cells at once. So to enable this encoding of a larger table of contents, we first split the entire table into multiple blocks. And there are two ways to do this split. One way is to row based encoding. So here uh, we have like, um, like the table to be encoded block by block. And here the block, blocks are arranged in the row-based manners. So each block includes several like adjacent rows. Then we can like have this like um, study window to scan through the entire table to obtain this row-based block embedding. The another way to do this split is through column-based encoding. So this time each table block includes several columns. Again, we'll apply this like study window to compute our column-based block embedding. In our full spreadsheet code architecture, we include both the row-based and column-based components to represent diverse local tablet structures, which can occur in user written spreadsheet tables. So this is just about the first stage of the encoding process. In the second stage, we include some row-wise and column-wise convolution. And the motivation of including these one-dimensional convolution layers is to model this long-range dependency. So Basically, for the first stage, this blockwise embedding allows us to incorporate more context for model prediction. But if we look into the embedding vector for each cell, then it only considers the context within the same block. So basically, these one-dimensional convolution layers are designed to model this dependency across different local blocks. On the slides, I'm showing this column-wise convolution as an example. So basically here, our uh, one-dimensional convolution kernel can like uh, basically like uh, cover across different local blocks. So after we apply this convolution, for the second stage of embedding vectors, the context includes like uh, both like cell values within the same block and also across different blocks. And this same convolution kernel will be applied to a full table to like um, reach out to our, our final table embedding. Then uh, for formula prediction, we design a two-stage coding process to model the output formula structures. So if in the first stage, the model decodes the sketch, including both spreadsheet functions and literals. Then in the second stage, the model decodes the ranges, which are these like relative uh, cell references as the arguments to the spreadsheet functions. For relation, here I presented the results we also like um, like uh, read, wrote down in our ICML paper. So the evaluation is on a small subset of like special formulas, uh, which includes around 20 million raw formulas. So this is an initial set uh, where like uh, we are allowed to use this data to do some like preliminary, preliminary like, experiments before we can really uh, train the full model uh, to be used in production. So here for the metric, we define the formula accuracy to be the, the, the exact syntactic match. So this means that the predictive formula should be exactly the same as the annotated ground truth formulas. So first we can see that our full model can achieve around 42% top one accuracy, uh, which is like why we think it is very like um, um, exciting to really incorporate this learning model into the production pipeline. And from this tech, uh, comparison to baselines, we mainly want to like highlight the importance of modeling the tablet structures. So uh, for example, especially for this robust field based time. So robust field is the state of our neural neural architecture for the flash field problem where they learn to operate the Microsoft Excel data. So basically for this robust field architecture, it considers each spreadsheet data row or column as an independent improper pair. So they formulate this problem as a program by example problem. So basically from this performance like a comparison, we can really see that 
like modeling this like uh, dependency across different like uh, rows or columns will be very helpful for better generating these formulas. And the second part of the relation, I will show this importance of understanding input data of different formats, especially in the natural language contents. So here we can see that these headers really uh, play a crucial role in understanding the spatial data because they usually provide some like very like short like um, or also they only provide some short descriptions of data, but these natural language like descriptions can still be very helpful for the model to better understand the spatial data. Finally, I also want to show some like uh, results on this breakdown prediction accuracy of formulas of different sketch lenses. So here we can see that clearly these longer formulas are harder to predict and for all the models, the performance drop. But still our full model performs the best uh, in all the group, these groups. And note that one reason why like our model is like harder to generate these longer formulas is because the distribution of user written formulas is highly skewed towards shorter ones. So once our model is trained on such a data distribution, it is like uh, harder to like uh, generate longer formulas when some user like happens to need uh, the generation of long formulas. So this phenomenon in like these practical scenarios is also partially uh, one motivation for like why we want to study this compositional transition behavior and which uh, I will discuss in the third part of my talk. So to summarize, the first part is about like uh, showing like how we, we can model the structure and multi-modality of the programming context to enable these real applications with ambiguous program specifications. Okay, uh, maybe we can take some uh, questions. Yeah. Uh, uh, maybe I'll start. So in terms of like the, 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 the accuracy of the model, so what, what are the failure modes? Uh, do you see like on some uh, particular formulas, your model, you know, is struggling and you know, if you could, you know, give us a little bit more intuition, what, what are the modes that your, your model, you know, is, you know, having a hard time to capture that would be good? Yeah, uh, so clearly one failure mode is like when the formulas are super long, yeah, for example, it might be some like a very like a long like a uh, arithmetic calculation of, of like several different cells. And also uh, another thing is that um, although our model can support many operators, but clearly it can support those like, like addition modification operators uh, better than some other API calls. So for example, actually in the special language, it can support the, like, the calls to let's say Google Translate or some Google Finance operators. So they might be like generating if they really like occur very frequently, but uh, for many scenarios, even if the model generates these like uh, operators accurately, still the arguments will be harder to predict for like uh, for such kind of formulas. So in general, I would I would still say like um, the model will perform better on those formulas that user like wrote more frequently. This is why actually in our user feedback, some users say that actually it can predict ninety eight percent of the formulas accurately because they only use these use like spreadsheets to write some very commonly used formulas. I see. I see. And in your uh, input set that 20 million samples you have, like, you also have the formulas, right? In the, in the Excel sheets in your training? Yeah, for training, it is basically supervised learning here. And what is the distribution of, um, you know, easy versus hard formulas in your training? Is it like also, skewed towards like uh, simpler formulas compared to the, the longer ones? Or do you see like more, um, you know, longer formulas are like, you know, also represented in your training? Yeah, uh, so basically our training distribution is just, um, we didn't do any like, uh, like weighty sampling or something. So in practice, actually uh, around 85% of the formulas are contain the like number of operators of two or three in total. So this is really highly skilled towards these like shorter formulas. But actually, even for like these like formulas with only like uh, two to three operators, still the like the range of the uh, arguments these cells can be like very wild across all the tables. So it is still a challenging task. And actually, if we on, if we only compute the accuracy based on these operators, ignoring these cell like uh, references, the accuracy top one accuracy can be around like uh, seventy percent also. Okay, fantastic. So let me see if there are uh, questions from the class. 
all clear. Uh, there is a question um, in the in the Zoom. I think um, you answered that. Um, um, okay. Uh, I I don't see any questions from the class. Yeah. So like uh. So I guess I can move on to the second part. Yes. Cool. Yeah. So in the second part, I will focus on this like challenge of generating more complicated programs uh, by like learning with this execution. So I will first talk about the project execution guided program synthesis. So in this part, I will focus on the setup where we have these improper samples as part of the program specification. So besides, I'm showing an example from the Carol domain. So Carol is an educational programming language that has been used in some actual CS courses, such as Stanford CS 106A. So basically, given these like input output like uh, pairs, uh, the, the students uh, need to like finish write programs to like um to satisfy these input output applications uh, for their homeworks or for their exams. But like uh, satisfying these given improv examples is just the first step. For the full evaluation, we also need to like execute this synthesis program on a set of hurdle test cases, which are not visible to the, to the model. So basically it means that the model should not just like um, overfit to the given improv pairs, it should, the functionality should be general enough to cover some relevant cases. Here on the slides, I'm showing the full grammar of this Carol language. So you can see that Carol is a, is a like domain specific language. So the goal is to uh, write some like programs to control a robot in a simplified two dimensional grid world. Compared to like prior works on like program by example problems, the core challenge here is that the model also needs to generate these programs with control flow constructs such as if else statements and also loops such as repeat and while loops. So to solve these input output programs since it's problems, the standard architecture also follows this encoder decoder framework. So for the encoder, it computes embedding vectors for these input output samples. So for the Carol task, the input uh, are two dimensional grid words. So the model is convolutional neural network here. Then later on for the alpha code project, the input output pairs are like represented as strings. So we use a transformer architecture as the encoder. Then the decoder is a language model to like uh, generate a program token by token. So this is a pretty like a uh, like reasonable framework to start with. But if you apply at least a uh, standard architecture for program synthesis problem with improper pairs, then one limitation is that at each decoding step, the model always feeding this same set of input examples as the as like um as part of the input. So Basically, uh, it means that the model doesn't leverage this execution effect. So what do I mean here? Because for us as humans, when we write programs, usually we will not just like, write all, all the code without like any sort and token by token. Instead, after we write down one code block or implement one function, we might like uh, stop here and think about what is the intended execution behavior and how will this like, how will the execution like behavior changes at this point? So this like uh, imagination of execution process will help us think about what are the remaining code we need to implement to like, uh, fulfill the intended functionality for the task. But since this standard architecture doesn't leverage this execution, so this means that for the decoder, it simply represents the program as a token sequence. So uh, it only considers the syntax, but not this semantic meaning of the program. Then to formulate the intuition of like uh, program synthesis by humans, we design this execution guided program synthesis framework. And here I will use an example of synthesizing straight line programs without control flow constructs to like uh, to like uh, illustrate how this technique works. So at the beginning of the synthesis process, still the model input includes these initial like pairs of input outputs, but this time with execution guided synthesis, when the model predicts any program statement, such as put marker here, this statement is immediately executed and results in a change of the current state. So the next time step, this new state is 
fed into the model and guides the subsequent synthesis of the program. So in this way, our model is able to leverage this intermediate execution like a results, which provide more fine-grained descriptions of the, of the program execution behavior. So it also helps the model to better understand what are the remaining code that need to be written to like transform from a current state to a target state. We can further extend this idea to see that programs with control flow structures by executing conditions. So every time when the model predicts a condition, such as those conditions in these if else statements, then we first execute this condition on all the given program inputs and we split them into two subsets, one for the true branch and one for the first branch. Then we feed the corresponding subsets to the synthesizer to generate the two branches like separately. And finally, we'll combine the prediction of two branches together. So this execution of both conditions and the straight line program statements allow the model to also support different like, control flow structures, including if else statements and also while loops. At this point, I discussed how we can leverage these intermediate execution results to improve the synthesis quality of one program. We can further utilize the full execution result of, of the model to like help us to select better final like uh, predictive programs um, for for evaluation. So this uh, assumes that we can get like multiple program synthesizers to generate like different candidate programs, or we can use the same program synthesizer to sample multiple programs. So in the literature of deep learning for other uh, domains, including computer vision or natural language processing, etc., the standard practice is to select the majority vote among all the predictions, or we can do some like weighted sampling you according to the probability, like uh, pre the predictive probability by the model. But in the case of program synthesis with improper examples, one advantage is that we can further utilize this provided improper examples to do a filtering process. So at least we can already filter out those predicted programs that cannot pass these given improper samples. Then uh, for the remaining programs, we still want to select one that uh, might generalize better to unseen test cases. So for this selection, uh, we find that uh, two very simple uh, ensemble principles are the most effective. The most way, uh, the most like, uh, the one, one like, uh, Ways to just um, like, uh, send this like, shortest uh, program as the final prediction. And the intuition is that uh, such a program might be like uh, less specific to the given improper pairs. Another way to select the final prediction is to just do the standard majority vote to like uh, re return the most frequently predicted program. So here I'm showing the variation results on the Carroll benchmark. Uh, compare with this prior work of uh, et al.'s paper. So basically, our model architecture is exactly the same uh, as their model, but we further add this execution guided synthesis techniques. So in, uh, in general, our technique can be also applied to like um, any kind of model architectures for such problems. And for relation metric, this like exact match uh, is the basically the same as the metric we used for special cultivation where we consider the prediction to be correct if it is synthetically the same as the annotated ground truth program. But before, because like for the same functionality, there can also be many different programs uh, implemented in synthetically different way. So this generalization accuracy means um, the generative program can pass the improper pairs both in the provided program classification and also in the herd out test cases. So here we can see that with like a, uh, each of our execution guided like, synthesis and ensemble techniques, our approach can like, outperform this like, MLE uh, training um, by already by a, like, um, a large margin in terms of generalization accuracy. And in particular, if we combine both techniques together, we can achieve like 92% generalization accuracy on top of a 77% accuracy. So basically previous results are still about like synthesizing programs in domain specific languages. Then in the alpha code project, we further show how we can like, um, like solve these very challenging competitive programming problems and go beyond these domain specific languages. Then here, besides these improper examples, 
the mod the proper description also includes this uh, natural language. Then I give a list description. Then uh, for for the model prediction, it needs to generate the program in real world programming languages. Like here, this is a code predicted by alpha code model in Python. Uh, actually, this is a correct solution for the previously like uh, shown problem. So the core challenge for such like uh, competitive programming problems is that although it is given the natural language descriptions, there's no direct mapping between this natural language and the, and the final code because the, the, the natural language description also describes what is the intended execution behavior, but it doesn't like tell how to implement this functionality step by step. So given such a task that it is even ch challenging for top human programmers. So what is the current status of our language models? So we evaluate our alpha code model on the code forces platform, and it participates in 10 competitions with over 5,000 other human programmers. And we used an ensemble of 41 billion and 9 billion models. And for each problem, our model sends 10 final submissions. Then across the 10 contests, alpha code is ranking is among top 54.3%. And if we consider the performance for all these 10 contests, it is actually among top 28% of all code forces users. Definitely, this is still far below the top human programmer performance. So this is not the same as the like the alpha zero project, which can outperform the best like uh, human chess players. But still, we consider this result to um, be like a one impressive like um, like showcase of language models in terms of these uh, emerging algorithmic reasoning capabilities. So, given these results, there's one quick question we can ask. So the question is whether is for a scale algorithm model will just solve the problem, because we know that for the OpenAI codes and GPT three, they have one hundred seventy five billion parameters. And for the most recent Google Palm model, it has uh, 540 billion parameters. To answer this question, here I show this like a scaling curves of, of, of models of different sizes. And the y-axis is the like a pass rate for the problems. If we compare these different curves, especially comparing the curves of 9 billion and 41 billion models, we can see that the performance scan becomes less and less significant with larger models. And there's one data point I want to highlight here. If for all of these models, we only allow them to generate 10 programs per problem, then none of these models can achieve like decent performance with such a few samples. This means that for our final 10 submissions, they actually come from much more samples from the models. And in practice, we like uh, decode 1 million programs per problem using these models. So this also means that if we further scale the model, it, it does not only like uh, incur more competition resources for training, also the sampling, but uh, sampling like a uh, budget becomes like a uh, very like um very expensive. Since this model scaling itself uh, won't completely solve the problem, so in our alpha code project, we designed several techniques in the training and uh, inference phases. But here in the talk, I will highlight one very crucial process in the sampling phase which is this filtering and clustering procedure where we leverage program execution at scale to like really significantly improve the performance. So the first phase about filtering, it is actually ex uh, exactly the same as the first stage of execution guided synthesis ensemble. So execute all the programs on this example test in the problem description and filter out those samples that do not pass the test. This very simple filtering process already can filter out over 99% of samples uh, for models of, of all different sizes. So this also means that although these models are already like, uh, better at understanding natural language uh, by, by like, scaling up the size, but still in terms of satisfying these very like, uh, strict semantic constraints, um, they uh, still um, kind of fail to do so. Then if we consider the initial pool of 1 million programs, then 1% of remaining programs still re means there are 1,000 programs. So here, instead of relying on some heuristics to select the, select the uh, final program, 
we uh, instead uh, propose this clustering process, which we follow utilize execution for selecting the final submissions. Recall that here, the main obstacle is that the hidden tests for test problems are not available. But actually for training problems, we can kind of have this hidden test because we have the ground truth programs, which allow us to generate as many inputs as possible. So we can utilize these training problems with their like test cases to train a separate model with the same alpha code architecture to generate new test inputs. And note that we don't have to generate the outputs. We only need these inputs. Then we execute the remaining like um, uh, programs on these generating inputs. Then we cluster all programs with the same outputs together because we can assume that if we generate enough number of like test cases, then those like programs with the same execution like, uh, behavior will be semantically equivalent. Then for the 10 largest clusters, we sample one program from each as our final submissions. So here on the, uh, on the slides, I will show some like, uh, results to demonstrate this effectiveness of filtering and clustering. We can see that this filtering with execution is really crucial, which allows the model to utilize like a more sample budget to improve the performance. And I also want to highlight like, uh, two comparisons. So why is about the improvement from like um, scaling to 41 billion from 9 billion model. Another is about adding clustering to the 41 billion model. So if you compare this performance game, actually you can see that this clustering process can provide more gain than scaling alone. So this also means that um, by designing some better training and also this inference like uh, techniques, they may pr uh, provide more performance scan than simply scaling out the model. But still, if we compare this with this Oracle sample selection, where we execute all the programs on these like uh, hidden test cases, still we can see a, a gap from this Oracle selection. So there are still some like a um, like, uh, further work that can be done to, in, to close this gap. And uh, the final results I want to discuss in this AlphaCode project is about its variation on the apps benchmark. So apps is another like a public benchmark for coding problems. And here the difficulty of the programs can range from this introductory like, pro coding problems to also to these competitive programming problems. So by comparing the 1 billion alpha code model to the 2.7 billion GPT Neo model, we can see that alpha code can outperform this GPT Neo model with like two times like a more parameters. And if we compare with code S, which includes 12 billion parameters, still the performance is pretty comparable. Although code S is 12 times as large as the alpha code model. So to summarize in the second part, I show that leveraging these intermediate and full execution results can improve the capacity of these CSS programs by uh, utilizing these input output samples. So before I go into the third part, uh, I wonder whether there are any questions uh, I, I, we can discuss. Um, there's a question. Yes, Alex, go ahead. Yeah, so I guess like in, in real world settings, right, you know, most uh, software engineering and really most of the difficulty in software engineering is like understanding large code bases and generating code that will make sense in context. Mm -hmm. so is there anyone working on or, or is anyone that will working on sort of the, the problem of understanding like large code base context and generating code that will make sense uh, in, in, in a particular context? Uh, are you referring to like those like uh, code completion? Like basically, once when, when you write down the code in some like IDE, it uh, automatically generates some uh, suggested like uh, code snippets uh, later on. Uh, sure, I guess sure that would be like one case. But like you know, if you had like a text-based description and maybe some examples, but then also you're given you know this has to make sense within this you know million line of code uh, uh, project. Um, you know, and basically, like, is, is that sort of a direction that, that people are working on? Yeah, uh, this is actually a very like, good question. I would say that right now for like code suggestions, definitely like um, uh, supported and studied uh, by like um, is, uh, at least many like companies like Microsoft has their like um, has their like, Visual Studio with this code suggestion feature and also like uh, OpenAI Codex is applied in the GitHub compiler and Google has its own version, etc. 
But right now, uh, this model is still focus more on the context within the same file. And this support of different files is indeed very challenging because the model needs to like, first understand uh, what are some other files in the same project that are relevant and then to connect to it. So uh, right, this is definitely already an open research question in this like, uh, program synthesis or code suggestion domain. Thanks. Yeah, thanks for the question. Any other questions? But just a, a quick question on the previous slide. So what was the step that had a you know, huge impact on the, on the results? So if you go one more uh, slide uh, back. Mm -hmm. Okay, so can you explain the filtering uh, the filtering step here? So what, what, what are you filtering here? Oh. Uh, so basically, uh, for the for the for the filtering part, um, because for the for the like uh, programming programming problems, usually in the problem description, it also shows like some example of these tests. So um, so then basically, um, and you, usually the problem description only includes like uh, one one to like uh, one to two of such uh, problems. Um, so basically, uh, this means. Uh, so basically, we can first execute all these programs to see whether they whether they pass uh, this uh, description. Um, so the example is uh, basically here. Like like you can. So this is a real problem from the Code Forces uh, platform. You can search for this like uh, problem title. So basically, you can see that there are there is one improper pair here. So at least the model needs to like produce the same output as provided here. So this is about the filtering process. Okay, great. Uh, one more question. So maybe even starting with like a very simple case. Suppose I have, you know, a program, very simple program, um, with you know, a couple of lines. You know, I don't know some some of these, you know, two input numbers. You know, do something. Mm -hmm. Realizable case. I generate some inputs and outputs. So. What is basically the limitation here? Is the limitation, let's say I generate, you know, you know, 1,000 instances of the inputs and outputs from this simple, um, you know, program. Mm -hmm. and, and then I optimize over the class of programs with the same, with the same, um, you know, keywords and functions. Is the limitation here, the number of input output samples that we have in those simple cases, or um, let's say maybe I have like 10 or 20 and I don't generalize them to some new instances, or is the limitation that we don't really, we are not really able to effectively optimize in the discrete space, you know, compared to, uh, you know, training, you know, models, you know, neural networks that are, you know, often done in the continuous system. Yeah, um, so uh, actually we can think about it in another way. So. Uh, if we are providing some like finite number of these improper pairs, then um, one way to satisfy these given improper examples is to just um, just just like write a program to uh, do a, a bunch of if else statements and say that once the input is this, we can output that. And actually, uh, we have seen that with language models, they sometimes just um, write programs to like um, basically check the evaluation executor in this way. But the more important thing is definitely about uh, generalization. So, for example, even in the case of like uh like like um this like uh writing the summation programs. So if we are if we are asked the model to generate this program itself because it is simple, so the model is able to do that. So let's say if we use train another neural network to learn this addition multiplication or, or like uh, multiplication etc. Without this prior, then still uh with such like uh fine like limited samples, uh, it can still be hard to generalize to like other test cases. So I think here basically the the problem is really about like um given these like input outputs and also other descriptions whether the model can abstract out the right template to like um to move forward so it knows like uh, what is the intended like, structure of the solution. Thanks. Okay, yeah, thanks for the question. Do see any more questions from the class? Um, I see a question in the chat. So it says that in this supervised approach, how is the loss applied on the model prediction? Is it directly on the code limit? Uh, right, for this like alpha code model, we also uh, do the supervised learning. So the model is like, trying to produce the correct solution given, given the like a problem input. 
And in the full paper, actually, we also have some other like um, and some other like tricks in training. For example, uh, we we because for each these training problems from the code forces platform, we also have access to the incorrect solutions. And actually, we train a, a model also on is these incorrect solutions, and we have another classifier to say whether it is uh, correct or not. So there are some other auxiliary training objectives. But in general, yes, uh, we we mainly like utilize this uh ground truth of problem solutions for training. Uh, any other questions? I think they're good. Okay, cool. Then I can also talk about in the third part. Yeah, the third part, I will like uh, really introduce this challenge of compositional generalization uh, via program learning. So recall that at the beginning, I discussed this compositional generalization for future learning. So we can see that um, our humans, as us as humans, are very good at uh, generalizing uh, compositionally from only a few demonstrations, but standard sequence to sequence models struggle at that. And here I want to give some more like, like a concrete description about what I mean for compositional generalization in the context of sequence to sequence learning. So given the knowledge of basic components and a few demonstrations of layer combinations, Compositional generalization requires the model to generalize this knowledge to novel combinations. So one aspect is to think about some new combinations of these primitives. For example, if a model is learned to translate walk, walk twice, and jump, then at the test time, the model should also know how to translate jump twice. Another aspect is length generalization, which requires the model to generalize to longer test samples than the training samples. For example, for grammar parsing or program learning, if a model is like trained to pass these like uh, shorter uh, uh, programs, the model should also understand the, the meaning of the longer programs. Since the like standard like uh, neural networks are struggling at achieving this generalization uh, capability, so there are some prior works on how to improve the compositional generalization, and they mainly fall into fall into two categories. One category is to like uh, still like uh, build upon this sequence to sequence learning uh, framework. So the model output is the is the is the like uh, corresponding uh, target sequence for the source sequence. But then built upon this framework, there will be some like design of the uh, training techniques and architecture like uh, adaptation. So here I will briefly like introduce one example. So you can see that here on the slides, this is a sequence to sequence model with some like a uh, memory uh, memory augmentation. So here the support input and output means, means that basically uh, the, for the, it is like uh, basically uh, with another data mutation technique, which uh, tries to like uh, learn some permutations of these short sequences. And the goal is that at the test time, the model should like adapt to a new grammar quickly because the gra new grammar may have this like different mapping of the primitives. So, this usually for least kind of approaches, they can improve primitive generalization, but still they will fail on length generalization. Another way is to like is to actually directly generate the symbolic grammars. So we can imagine that if the model learns the like, the accurate like, grammar rules, then it definitely can generalize to different lenses. But then the limitation here is that because the model needs to generate the grammar itself. So it also needs these data mutation techniques to like uh, to like um design a meta grammar space and assume that the target grammar of interest lies in this space of grammar. And also uh, we can imagine that uh, the grammar that can be seen as accurately cannot be super large. So uh, for some for many of existing tasks on compositional generalization, um, the number of grammars can be just 10 to 20, but in practice, the real world grammars can be much larger. So uh, given these prior approaches, so the goal of our project is to really achieve full generalization on primitive and learn stack uh, generalization problems, while we do not want to utilize these like uh, training data mutation techniques. So uh, here I will introduce our approach, neural symbolic stack machines, or we call NES. So a high level idea is that instead of generating the output sequence from the input sequence directly, we design a neural network as the controller to predict execution traces uh, to, for, for an underlying symbolic stack machine. 
sorry, after we, the machine executes the, this, like, uh, this provided trace, it will produce the output sequence. In particular, the stack structure in the symbolic machine supports recursion, which is crucial for lens generalization. Now I will talk about this like symbolic stack machine design. So the machine maintains a stack where uh, the stack has this layer-wise structure, and each layer includes like some like uh, input like uh, input tokens or some like uh, sequences in the output space, which are the intermediate execution results. So this layer-wise structure allows the model to basically decompose the initial potentially long input sequence into different components and, propose, and basically process them in a recursive way and finally combine them together. So this is very helpful for generalizing to new combinations of these primitives or also to like longer test sequences. And besides the stack, our machine also maintains a queue for reading the input sequence and a memory module to keep the intermediate execution outputs. And there are several operators that can be executed by the machine. So here, push and pop are some stack operators. And the read operator is for reading the input sequence. And this reduce and continuation are for sequence manipulation. And the final operator is for terminating the machine. Here on the slides, I'm showing a full picture of this, stack, uh, of this generated execution trace to pass as input jump around threads. So in general, our, the, the goal of our symbolic machine design is to like, uh, inherently provide some constraints on the, this learned, uh, sequ learned sequence for execution because our symbolic operators encourage the model to learn those like, uh, passing or translation op operations that might be more consistently applicable to a wide range of input sequences instead of uh, being more specific to just uh, one sequence. So in this way, once our model is can fit to the training data, it has a more like possibility of to generalize to like other test inputs. So this is different from standard sequence to sequence learning because in that case, the output for each input sequence can be arbitrary. So it is uh, hard to guarantee that the model can like fit to the exact correct solution to do this like a uh, translation or parsing problems. Then with this neural symbolic design, the core challenge is to train the model without any supervision on these intermediate execution traces. So um, to, to, like this, to decide which execution traces are more like, uh, possible to generalize, we define this notion of operational equivalence. So the core idea is that semantically similar sequences should require execution traces with similar operators. For example, Primitive generalization is one special case of this operational equivalence, where different execution traces only differ on reduced arguments. For example, if we look at these two sequences, walk that and run and jump that and run. So these two sentences only differ in the first word, walk and jump. So in general, the, the structure of the sentence are the same, so the operators should be the same. And the only difference should be like how we like translate these two words, walk and jump with different reduced arguments. To search for such operation equivalent traces, we design a correct learning scheme with the assumption that operational equivalent traces should always be the same lesson. So here I will illustrate this idea uh, with a simple example of learning addition and multiplication rules. So here, the first lesson will only include expressions of in, including one operator. So from lesson one, the model should learn that these like X and Y, zero and one, et cetera, should be operationally equivalent. Then the lesson two includes these expressions with two operators. So from here, the model should understand that addition and multiplication operators are not operationally equivalent because they have different priority orders when they are in the same expression. So to learn addition and multiplication like, uh, operations, uh, these two lessons are enough to understand their semantic meaning. Or we can imagine that without this, like, um, this curriculum learning or without some like, uh, symbolic like, uh, bias, then if we only train the standard models with uh, such a few samples, then they can hardly generalize to operate like, um, like those expressions with like, uh, more operators or also like, um, more of these constants. 
And finally, this is about some architectural design to like uh, enforce this operational equivalence. So the core idea is that we will include some category predictors in our neural controller. So they will produce consistent embedding vectors for those operational equivalent primitives and phrases. And in this case, uh, they can be like, um, they can also like uh, be pro provided with the same like uh, predicted operators uh, for the in, the, in the final execution traces. For Asian, here I want to show some different aspects of like a uh, conversational generalization emphasized by previous benchmarks. So the first benchmark is scan for translating natural language to action commands. So this is a, a, like a domain we'll have been using to illustrate our symbolic machine. So this is a relatively small synthetic grammar with 10 to 15 grammar rules. And here's another example of future compositional learning. So this is the example I showed to say, to like um, demonstrate the difference between human learning and also this like uh, sequence to sequence model. The third benchmark is compositional machine translation. So this is, this is a, like a, a restricted domain of English to French translation task, where all the English sentences start with these phrases such as I am, you are, they are, et cetera. So at the test time, the model will be given some new combinations of these like uh, words learned in the training set. And finally, I also show some uh, uh, examples of context-free grammar parsing. So this demonstrates the challenge of length generalization where the test samples can be, let's say, 5,000 times longer than the training samples. So first on the scan benchmark, uh, here from this uh, comparison to other models, we show that our next model is able to achieve 100% accuracy without any training data mutation. And for other tasks, it also shows that uh, with this like, neural, like this symbolic prior baked in the neural networks, our model is able to achieve 100% generalization on all these different types of like conversational generalization benchmarks. So one like common properties of these benchmarks is that they want to emphasize solely on this conversational generalization challenge. So basically, they, all the data samples in their training and test sets follow the same uh, grammar. So this actually means that if the model can learn this underlying grammar, it can achieve 100% accuracy. So there are some differences here um, like compared to those like a real world natural language processing benchmarks where the input um, has more like noise ambiguity. And this is, there will be, it is, will be in, nearly impossible to achieve 100% accuracy on some like more like um, realistic benchmarks. So, um, um, uh, so uh, I think I also want to like briefly uh, discuss about some of our recent works on like a uh, conversational generalization by leveraging uh, large scale pre-trained models. Because in the previous two parts, I've shown that these models can achieve very decent performance on solving some challenging coding problems. So here we also want to see whether we can have some a uh, way to improve their conversational generalization as well. <clears throat> Here I'm showing this table from a recent paper called List to Most Prompting from our group at Google. And these are the results on the scan length split. So uh, from these like, uh, numbers, uh, we can see that actually, if we look at this uh, best number 99.7%, then the answer is actually yes. But if we compare with other numbers, so uh, this, this answer yes has some conditions. So the first requirement is that in the in the like prompt for the language model, it needs to have some like a few short demonstrations of these uh, reasoning rationales. So if we only use the standard prompting with only the different in, only the input output pairs, then still the accuracy is very low. On the other hand, the language model itself also needs to have good prior knowledge of both natural language and programming languages. Because for example, here the text da Vinci is the GPT three model without uh, like a Good, good training on the code. And these like code eventually are two versions of GPT of, of GPT-3 or, or the, or the um, channel code, uh, which are the code S models. So we can see that uh, the, the most recent code S model has like much better uh, uh, capabilities to achieve this transition than the other like two versions of a model. So I won't go into the details of how the prompts are designed because there are a couple of engineering tricks. But the high level idea is that we want to like um, baking this like uh, idea of recursion and also this like um, primitive mapping, etc. 
at se several different prompts and we do this prompting in different stages. So here in these two modes prompting, stage one is about this like command reduction. So this is basically the recursion step to like, break down the initial input sequence into different components. And in the second stage, it is about command mapping. So it will start with the like uh, the, the first piece, the simplest like a uh, part of the input sequence, then progressively like uh, translate the to the, the other components to form the final translation of the full sequence. And more recently, we extend this like a uh, technique to like uh, go beyond synthetic grammars and achieve this compositional generalization for understanding like uh, real world like, uh, programming languages such as Sparkle here. So we can see that these like real world uh, grammars have a uh, more complicated like uh, structures. Also, uh, they have a large vo large vocabulary. So there are two key two like uh, concrete challenges of input like um like arise here. The first is that a single prompt is no longer uh, sufficient to cover all grammar rules because, for example, for the Sparkle query in this CFQ benchmark, there are over two hundred grammar rules. Another like challenge is that. For the constitute translation, it will be context dependent. So the same phrase will have different meanings in a different question context, which makes this decomposition and recursion more challenging. So like to uh, deal with these challenges, we propose this like dynamic list to most prompting. So this means that we have we need to have some more like um more like a uh, complicated design for each phases of this like um of this like a uh, prompting scheme. So this, this time for the problem reduction, we also need to rely on some syntactic parsing learned by the language models. And, um, and also for exemplars, with this decomposition in the first phase, it allows us to retrieve the corresponding exemplars based on different constitute, constituent. And finally, we uh, combine all these like, different pieces together to uh, uh, solve our final problem. So variation here, the, the main result I want to highlight is that uh, we compare with these like fully supervised models trained on a full training set with around 100,000 samples. But with our prompting scheme, we only need to utilize an example, the pool of uh, 1,000 samples, and our prompting scheme can still outperform all these like fully supervised models. And similarly, on another like a uh, Cox benchmark called compositional generalization, we can achieve comparable results to these fully supervised SOTA models. So this is about the third part. Uh, this part I demonstrated that if we, or on, if we can incorporate this symbolic knowledge in, uh, into these like uh, neural networks via learning or prompting, it can enable this compositional reasoning over, na over natural language. And broadly, we can also think about it for many more problems. So this is the end of my... Uh, presentation and right now I want to give some summaries. So the first part is about showing the real world impact of these learning based program synthesis techniques in production. And the main challenge we deal with in the special coder project specifically includes this input ambiguity and large program space. So to deal with that, we designed a neural neural architecture to represent this multimodal structure input and also the output syntactic structures. The second part is about like uh, leveraging execution for solving challenging programming problems. So this part I include, I discuss uh, our projects or execution guided synthesis for leveraging partial program execution. And also introduce the as program execution like, technique in alpha code project to, sell, to, to like uh, show that leveraging this execution at scale can enable us to solve more challenging competitive programming problems. So finally, I discuss our work on neural symbolic learning for compositional generalization. And here the challenge is really to think about the best way to represent the reasoning process to teach the neural network about this symbolic knowledge. Yeah, so this is the end. Uh, thank, thanks everyone for listening. And uh, I also like to check uh, are there other like, uh, questions and discussion. Fantastic. <laughs> So we have time for a couple of questions. So maybe I'll start. So in the um, in the compositional information that you have with the colors and and words, the your method achieved basically hundred percent on on the on the benchmark. 
uh, what would be the failure modes? Like, um, do you think that if you increase the complexity of the task, um, would uh, would you? So, I I want to understand like the limitations of uh, your approach. So, or you think that even if you increase like the complexity of the task, you still retain the one hundred percent accuracy in, in in those examples. Yeah, uh, I would say that for that specific uh, case, um, the failure mode should be that some like human participants in that experiment uh, do not pay enough attention or they didn't spend enough time for thinking. Because I assume that if uh, for us to think about it for a while, then we should not make, uh, we might not uh, make mistakes on, on that, that task. But for example, for the, for the CFQ uh, problems I just discussed, or for this kind of, um, uh, yeah, for example, for this like a uh, cost problem as well. Then here we can see that the output parts can be like uh, more complicated and includes a, a lot of structures. So basically, to solve this task uh, accurately, the model really needs to learn like um, let's say like um, more than one hundred or more than two hundred grammar rules in order to like pass them accurately. So I would say if if a person can like uh, really already has enough prior knowledge, then they can still do the task accurately because there is an underlying very precise rule here. But then it is uh, also harder to like um like quickly pick up by like uh by some like uh people, especially for those who haven't like done any programming problems before. So complexity really matters here. But basically, definitely the one hundred percent accuracy is due to the fact that uh in this task there is no ambiguity. So if a, a solution should be accurate, and it uh it should be like uh it should be a consensus among all those experts. Okay, excellent. Um, is a question? Yes, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, so for uh, symbolic stock machines, uh, mm -hmm. I quite understand uh, what uh, you gave it uh, into. Could you perhaps uh, go over those? Uh, uh, so what was your uh, input on that? Uh, so uh, you are asking about uh, the benchmarks? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so for the scan task, it is based, for example, it needs to translate the instructions like uh, jump around uh, twice and uh, and go around uh, right, uh, right, right twice, etc. So this is about passing these like, um, these like simplified natural language sequences into their, into their like corresponding action commands. So okay. a challenge here is that um, for the, it's the difference between training and test splits. For example, for the training split, it only includes action commands of including a uh, less less than 24 actions, for example, by the test time, the action commands can include up to 48 uh, actions in a, in a single like um, common line. So this is about that uh, benchmark. And for the future computational learning, so this is already the full training and test sets. So the, the challenge is that the training set is very small. So, uh, it, so the model needs to understand such a few samples and also to really learn this concept for the transition to test samples. And uh, for this conversational machine translation, the main complexity is about like at a, at a, a test time, there will be some different like, uh, combinations of these components. Like for example, in a training set, it says that uh, I am a Dexy. So this is the last sentence. This Dexy is also another pseudo word. At the test time, it will, uh, will have gives is such, such, uh, something like uh, you are Dexy, she's Dexy, et cetera. So these are some new combinations. Uh, finally, for this like uh, context free grammar parsing, the idea is that, uh, for example, for this like a uh, while loop, uh, we can like um we can basically like um compose it with other like sequences or blocks, uh, and we can do this conversation like um for like uh, as many times as we want, something like that. But at the training time, we are only given these like uh, um these instances of uh, uh, around like uh, ten tokens, like because uh, it is already enough to cover all the grammar rules. So the test time, the model needs to know some like um, new like uh, combinations of these uh, different grammar rules together. Excellent. Excellent. There's one more question. Yes, go ahead. I guess was one, this is like a multi-part question. I was just wondering what happens when the situations are noisier or fuzzier or messier. So at one level, like if you have noise and these kinds of problems you've already presented, I was also wondering in situations where the reasoning is, is maybe not where there isn't an exact grammar that explains things like human reasoning things you know logic's fuzzier than uh than these situations and third um when you're doing like program synthesis i guess randomized uh programs can how hard would it be to handle that situation 
Yeah. Uh, for the first question, so indeed, uh, for the for the symbolic machine, it is uh, better at handling these like a uh, rigorous inputs than the noisy samples. Uh, in practice, if we use if it has the it's like noisy samples, then for the neural uh, symbolic models, um, they they can they just simply cannot fit such samples because they are the outer layers. They cannot be used the, the same grammar rules. And actually, uh, I I didn't like include it here. But if we have, let's say, uh, just a few proportion of samples, like uh, five percent of the training samples, which cannot pass all these, uh, cannot satisfy all these grammar rules, then still the model can just fit the remaining like uh, grammar rules. And uh, so this is also why, like, um, for the second part of this, um, this computational generalization, like a uh, topic for the like uh, prompting using large language models, they have the potential to better understand this like noise, and this is a. Uh, Man, this, uh, one uh, main reason is because they are already pre-trained on this very large text and code corpus. So somehow they have some good prior knowledge about what are some underlying uh, grammar rules and also like what are some like um, some human bias uh, baked in this uh, training data. So they can be the very promising like um, uh, like um, some approaches for handling this uh, this noise and especially like for learning how to make uh, some random mistakes uh, such as how humans can do. So this is uh, one way is to think about the, this like a uh, problem. Yeah, and also actually I'm wondering what is the uh, what's the question about the randomized programs mean? Um, I guess it's a little bit fuzzier, but I can imagine like in an undergrad algorithms class we have like a section of like randomized algorithms, and if you ask a human programmer to write something that with like ninety percent probability finds the answer or something. Oh, I see. Like, like if you have a source of randomness in your computation model. Can you solve problems with that? Like competitive programming, I guess, is the one where it most naturally translates. But sounds more hazardous to work with. Yeah. Um. So. Um. Because right now, for example, for these models, which I just we just show the the best single prediction. So it is uh it is about like the most like uh the, like most like a restricted like a predictions to satisfy all the constraints. But if we allow the model to let's say like, sample some different different predictions, then with some probabilities, it can also like come up with some other solutions. And this is especially the case when we like uh, build upon it using large language models with the sampling process. Yeah, so uh, definitely this is one thing we can like, simulate with these like uh, neural networks. Okay, fantastic. And there's a question on the Zoom. Uh, basically, we studied this. Uh, do you think a greater number of samples will have a significant increase in performance in this context as well, as opposed to the model size? Yeah, this is a very great question, and especially for the Alpha Code project. One, one like challenge in terms of engineering is that because um we have a lot of GitHub code, um, but we really do not have that many of high quality like a uh, competitive programming problems with their solutions annotated. So actually uh, in our like final training set, we are able to collect like uh, around like uh, 13,000 samples from many like uh, many like uh, online, online, online judgment systems. And in practice, we find that, um, for example, we start with the code forces problems and we uh, then like uh, move on to collect more data. And uh, every time when we add more data, even if it's just like, let's say thousands of samples, it can really improve the performance drastically and uh, much better than how it can improve with model scaling. So I would say for these like most like specialized domains, um, which require some like high quality samples because the problem is very challenging, then data collection is very important. And it is uh, always helpful to like collect um, as many data as we want. And also I think uh, there, are, there are also some literature showing that if we uh, can have some like a very like a good filtering to, uh, to significantly improve the quality of the training data, then uh, even for the pre -train, in the pre-training phase, it can significantly improve performance uh, mm -hmm. if we compare it with just naively using all the data we have without any like uh, good uh, filtering and uh, data preprocessing. Okay, fantastic. Uh, in the interest of time, let's thank uh, Jimmy one more time. Yeah, thank you so much. It is uh, great to be here.